In this video, we are going to examine the effect of torque. Specifically, we're going to examine the effect of an effective torque. To begin, let's review our linear kinetics. Newton's second law tells us that that effective force is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. We also said with this equation that causes and effect were kind of in an opposite order. So if we rearrange our equation, we now have that the sum of the forces, or that effective force, divided by the mass equals the acceleration. Now we have the cause and the effect in the right order. We do not have an effective force because we have an acceleration. We have an acceleration because we have an effective force. The angular equivalent to Newton's second law will tell us that the sum of the torques equals I alpha, or the effective torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Once again, our causes and effect are kind of in a scrambled order. We do not have an effective torque because we have an acceleration. We have an angular acceleration because we have an effective torque. So if we rearrange the terms of our equation here, we can now see the cause and the effect. And the larger torque for a given moment of inertia will lead to a larger angular acceleration. We would also need a larger effective torque if we have a larger moment of inertia for any given angular acceleration. With our vector diagrams, we gave an example of moving in the positive direction from left to right. And we had a case where we had a certain given velocity for a body. At another point in time, that body sped up. Now, if a body is going to speed up, it changes its velocity that means it had to have had an acceleration that caused that velocity to change. If we are speeding up, the acceleration vector will always be pointing in the direction of the velocity vector. Now, what caused that acceleration? What caused that acceleration was a force that was going in the direction of the velocity vectors as well. We will always have an effective force vector in the direction of the acceleration because it is that effective force that creates that acceleration. Whenever we have a force that's going to cause something to speed up, we call that an effective force. And that effective force is going to be called, specifically if things are speeding up, a propulsive force. Let's stay with the analogy of moving in the positive direction. And we have a given velocity. At another point in time, we have a smaller velocity than what we previously had. This means that we were slowing down. If we're slowing down, we're changing velocity. If we're changing velocity, we had to have had an acceleration that caused that velocity to change. If we're slowing down, that acceleration vector has to be opposite of the direction of the velocity vector. And we said, what caused that acceleration? Well, we had to have had an effective force which caused that acceleration. And if we're slowing down, the acceleration vector has to be opposite the direction of the velocity vector. The effective force vector always has to be in the direction of the acceleration vector. So that means the effective force vector also has to be going opposite the direction of the velocity vector. Now, wait a minute. You could be saying in the previous lesson, you told us that the torque was equal to the length of the lever arm times the perpendicular force. Now you're telling us that the torque equals the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. And yes, both are true. On the left, you can think of that as being the cause. That force applied some distance from the axis of rotation is creating a torque. That torque is going to cause a body to accelerate depending on its moment of inertia. Now let's look at some vector diagrams. And let's look at a wheel as an example of this idea of angular velocity and angular acceleration. So to begin, we said that if a wheel was moving with a certain velocity, in this particular case, it's moving with an angular velocity that's going to be in the counterclockwise or positive direction. At some point in time later, it starts to speed up. This means that its angular velocity increases. So we can see that in one case, we had an angular velocity. At some point in time later, we had a greater angular velocity. 
If we have a change in our angular velocity, we had to have had an angular acceleration. And if things are speeding up, that angular acceleration has to be in the direction of the angular velocity vector. Now we're in a position to describe what caused that angular acceleration. So again, I'm going to start with the wheel moving with a certain angular velocity in the counterclockwise direction. At some point in time later, that wheel is going to be rotating faster. So it sped up where it had an increase in its angular velocity. So initially we have a certain angular velocity. Then we have a larger angular velocity. We said if we have a larger angular velocity, we had to have had an angular acceleration. And if things are speeding up, we have to have an angular acceleration that's in the direction of the angular velocity vectors. And now we can say that that angular acceleration was caused by a torque, or more specifically, an effective torque. And that effective torque was in the direction of the angular acceleration. Now let's say that I'm moving with a certain angular velocity. And at some point in time later, I am now moving more slowly. That wheel is rotating less than what it was rotating before. So I have a given angular velocity at one point in time. At another point in time, my angular velocity is less. We said that if my angular velocity is changing, I had to have had an angular acceleration. And if I'm slowing down, the angular acceleration has to be opposite of the direction of the angular velocity. Again, now we are in a position to describe what's causing that angular acceleration. So again, I'm going to start with a certain angular velocity. And now I'm going to be rotating more slowly. So I have a given angular velocity. At another point in time, I have a smaller angular velocity than what I had before, which we just described saying that we had to have an angular acceleration that was going opposite of the direction of the angular velocity vector. If I have an angular acceleration, I had to have had an effective torque. And that effective torque would be opposite of the direction of the angular acceleration. So to kind of recap, if I'm going in the positive direction and I speed up, I had to have had an angular acceleration that was in the direction of the angular velocity vector. If I have an angular acceleration, then I have to have had an effective torque, which was also going in the same direction as the angular acceleration. And if it's causing it to speed up, it has to be in the direction of the angular velocity vector. If I'm going in the positive direction, and now I'm slowing down the rotation, I had to have had an angular acceleration. That angular acceleration had to be negative, because if it's slowing down, the angular acceleration has to be in the opposite direction of the angular velocity vector. If I have an angular acceleration, that angular acceleration was being caused by an effective torque. And that torque is always going to be in the same direction as the angular acceleration vector. And if I am slowing down, that torque and the angular acceleration will be opposite the direction of the angular velocity vector. Similarly, I can be going in the negative direction. And if I speed up, my angular velocity changed. My angular velocity changed, I had to have had an angular acceleration. And if I'm speeding up, the angular acceleration will be in the direction of the angular velocity vector. In this case, since the, I'm rotating in the negative direction, the angular acceleration will also be negative. And if I have an angular acceleration, I had to have had an effective torque. The effective torque is always the same sign as the angular acceleration. And if I'm speeding up, the torque and the angular acceleration have to be in the same direction as the angular velocity vector. In this case, negative. Finally, I could be rotating in a negative direction. And then I can slow down. If I'm slowing down, I had to have had an acceleration. And that acceleration has to be opposite of the direction of the angular velocity vector. In this case, the angular acceleration would be positive. If I have an angular acceleration, I had to have had an effective torque, which was creating that angular acceleration. 
the effective torque and the angular acceleration are always in the same direction. In this case, they're both positive, opposite of the direction of the angular velocity vector, and causing the object to slow down. Next, let's revisit the angular equivalent of Newton's second law. We said the torque was equal to I alpha, or the torque was equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. We know the angular acceleration is equal to the change in angular velocity divided by the change in time. If we substitute this in for our angular acceleration, we will see that the torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity divided by the change in time. If we move the change in time over to the left-hand side of the equation, we will see the torque times the change in time is equal to the moment of inertia divided by the angular velocity. If we are dealing with a rigid body, that rigid body's moment of inertia will not change, so we can move the delta sign to the opposite side of the moment of inertia. Well, I hope everybody can appreciate that I omega, or that moment of inertia times the angular velocity, is equal to our angular momentum. So if we plug our angular momentum into the equation, we can see that the, the torque times the change in time is equal to the change in our angular momentum. This torque times the change in time is going to be our angular impulse. Our angular impulse is equal to our change in our angular momentum. And we can say that in order to be effective, a torque has to be applied over time or over a distance. The over a distance part we'll talk about in another lesson. But for right now, appreciate the fact that in order to be effective, that torque has to be applied over time. We can look at a graph of a torque time curve very similar to the graphs we looked at for a force time curve. Similar to our force curve, we can look at the peak torque, and we can say that that peak torque is going to be the largest magnitude or the largest distance away from the zero line. If we are increasing our torque, and it doesn't matter if we're increasing torque positive or negatively, if we're increasing our torque, the slope is going to be equal to the rate of torque development, or it's going to be the change in torque divided by the change in time. After we've reached our peak torque, we can see that our torque is going to decline. If our torque is declining, we can then quantify a rate of torque fatigue which again is going to be the change in torque divided by the change in time. But we're physically going to interpret these as an increase in torque as being the rate of torque development and a decrease in torque as being the rate of torque fatigue. And very similar to our impulse from a linear perspective, our angular impulse is going to be the area under the torque time curve. And so really it's not a matter so much of the absolute peak torque but it matters what the overall shape of that curve looks like and how much area there is underneath of it. And those are some of the effects of the torque, specifically the effective torque.